much like limit laws, we have laws for continuity as well. So we're going to assume that the functions we're looking at are already continuous. And then we're going to talk about the continuity of a new function based on that fact. So here are the five laws that, we're, that we have and that we're going to look at. So if we have two functions, f and g, and these functions are both continuous at a specific point a, then we have the following laws that hold. So f plus g is continuous at a. So if we think about this on a graph and we have say two functions, say two straight lines, these are continuous lines, right? If we take a look at a point a here, well, if we add those two points together, we just get a new point that's a little bit taller. So if we add these two curves together, what we end up is with another continuous function at a higher point. Okay. So we also have, if f and g are continuous at a point a, then f minus g will be continuous at a. So you can think of the same example we just showed, except the second curve is being subtracted from the first. If we have a constant c, so this could be a number like 3 or 2 or pi or whatever, then the constant times the function is continuous. So you can think of this as scaling, right? So if we have some curve that's like this, and then say we pick c is equal to 1 over 20, well, when we take that curve and we multiply it by 1 over 20, we're going to end up with something really small, right? It's still going to be continuous, but it's going to be scaled down. Okay. Now, we have if two functions are multiplied together, and those are both continuous, then f times g will be continuous at a. So sort of like scaling, except the scale is variable. So some points of the curve might be scaled by 2, some others by 4, some others by 6, and so on. And we also have the fact that f over g is continuous at a. But there's a restriction here because we cannot have g of a equal to zero because otherwise we would be dividing by zero and we know that we cannot do that. So these are the five rules that hold. I'm going to prove two of these for you. And they're not super rigorous proofs, so we're not using delta epsilon or anything like that. We're just going to use some basic facts about our limits and continuity. So for the proof of one, so this is the fact that f plus g would be continuous. We assume that both f and g are continuous to start. So the definition of continuity is that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f of a. So we're going to assume that's true. We're also going to assume that g is continuous. And the definition of that would say that the limit as x approaches a of g of x is equal to g of a. Now we're going to look at f plus g. So this needs to be continuous. So we need to show that the limit as x approaches a of f plus g of x is equal to, uh, how do we put this here? f plus g of a. So our goal is to prove this. But we can only use the facts that we have above. So let's see how we would do this. Well, we know that if we have the limit as x approaches a of f plus g of x, this is going to be equivalent to the limit as x approaches a of f of x plus the limit as x approaches a of g of x. So we can distribute this. Okay, now then we also know, according to our assumption, that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is going to equal to f of a. And the limit as x approaches a of g of x is also going to equal to g of a. Okay, so now we have f of a plus g of a, and we can distribute this in reverse. So what we'll end up with is f plus g of a. And therefore, we have shown that these two things are equivalent. Okay, and that's the proof. I know it's a really simple proof. It isn't as rigorous as you would get in a real analysis course, but in an intro course for engineers and other things, this would be the level of detail you would be expected for if you were given these proofs. And these are good exercises too, because if you're not used to doing proofs, it's a nice way to get yourself in the mindset. So let's do the proof where we scale a function. 
So if f is continuous, then c times f is continuous, where c is some constant number. Okay, so again, we're going to assume that f is continuous, so that is the definition, the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f of a, and we're going to assume c is a constant. Okay, so the limit as x approaches a of c f of x is going to be the same thing as the limit as x approaches a of c times f of x. And this is our limit laws. Again, if you're wondering where we're getting these ideas, it's from our limit laws earlier. And you see that they're actually quite similar to our continuity laws. Okay. Now we know too that if we have the limit of a constant times a function, we can pull the constant out. So this will be the same thing as c times the limit as x approaches a of f of x. Now we have c times, well, what is the limit as x approaches a of f of x? Our assumption says that that should be f of a. Oh, look at this. This is nice. If we group c and f together now, we can get uh, that c times f of a is equal to the limit as x approaches a of c times f of x. So we've shown now that the limit is equivalent to the value, which means that we have continuity. So again, we have another proof of continuity. It's really the same thing as what we just did before with adding functions, uh, but here we just have a constant. Okay. You'll find that a lot of these proofs are very similar if you do all five. I'm only gonna do one and three here, uh, but I encourage you to try two, four, and five on your own. In fact, if you wanna try and post them in the comments, I'm sure other people will tell you if you're crazy or if you're completely right. Okay, so there's some interesting consequences of this, and the point of the video really wasn't for the proof. It was to show you what the continuity laws tell you about other things. So for instance, polynomials. Why did I show you the addition and the multiplication proofs? Well, for this reason, because polynomials are just combinations of constants times values all added together. So you might remember a polynomial being something like 3x squared plus 2x plus 3. Well, here we have a constant times of a variable, a constant times a variable, and a constant, and these are all added together. So if we want, we could even think of these as three separate functions as being added together. So this is a general way to put this. Uh, polynomial x is equal to a constant times, or sorry, constant plus another constant times x1 plus another constant, another constant times x2 plus so on all the way up until the highest value. So we want to show that these are continuous everywhere. So let's start out by showing what the limit of a constant is and what the limit of a variable is, and then we're going to use our continuity laws to smush it all together. Okay, so the limit as x approaches a of a constant, well, constants are just a single value. There's no variable here. So as we approach some limit, it doesn't matter. Uh, the value of the constant as the limit approaches a is just going to be the constant itself. So that does not change. But if we take the limit as x approaches a of x to the i, where i is some index, some variable, then we're just going to replace x with a because x is approaching a. So this will be a to the i. Okay, so the limit as x approaches a of x to the i is a to the i, and the limit as x approaches a of our constant is our constant. So now we have some continuity laws, right? We know that a constant times a uh, variable, in which case cxi, is continuous. We just proved that using 3 from before. We also showed that if we have a function f and a function g, they are going to be continuous, and that was from one that we saw earlier. So if we have C0, which is continuous, if we have C1 times X1, which is continuous based on three here, and we have C2X2, which is continuous for the same reason, and we add them all together, it's still gonna be continuous because that's what we see here. So we've used these two rules and these two laws to show 
formally in a sense here. I didn't quite write out the words as you should in the proof, but we've demonstrated the main points to show that polynomials are going to be continuous everywhere. Now, these are not polynomials that are divided by other polynomials. These are just a polynomial on their own. So any constant times a variable added up together. Okay, so polynomials are continuous everywhere. And that's helpful. That's helpful information because that means that we can do derivatives on any polynomial. This means we can find average values when we get into integration for any polynomial and so on. Okay. So what other functions are continuous? So we saw polynomials are continuous, and here I have some graphs of some other ones that you might see. But what this means is that if we know these functions are continuous, we can use our continuity laws on them to understand whether more complex functions are continuous. So sine theta, for example, if we take a look at the sine graph, uh, we know that sine uh, alternates between one and negative one. And this is infinitely long, so it doesn't matter what our x-coordinate is, what our angle is, this is continuous everywhere for no matter what angle we pick. We take a look at the inverse trig functions. Uh, so this is where we swap our y and our x values, we see a slightly different picture. So now on the y-axis uh, between negative 1 and 1, it's continuous. In fact, this uh, would repeat as we go on. But there are these asymptotes. So sort of coming between them uh, that make it so those points are never hit. So it's continuous between negative 1 and 1. And you would find this with arc cos as well. Uh, if you're not quite familiar with this notation for arc sine, this would be the same thing of sine inverse theta. It is easier to write sine inverse theta, but you might get it confused because inverses are different. Well, the, the notation for trig functions isn't the best. So if you're not using the arcs at the beginning, uh, I would suggest making that change instead of writing it as sine inverse theta. That's just a personal recommendation. It's not going to it's not going to kill you not to, uh, but just for clarity's sake. Uh, the arc notation is what I'll be using for all future videos. Okay, so those are trig functions. Uh, we also have some continuity for logs and exponential functions. So for instance, e to the x is continuous everywhere. And here's a graph of e to the x uh, before, so e to the 0, if you remember, is equal to 1. Anything to the left, so that's on this point, anything to the left is going to be less than 1, but never going before 0. And after that, the curve shoots up, but it is continuous everywhere. So you might think, well, what about at e to the 100? Is that curve that's heading this direction ever going to reach over in this point? The answer is yes, it will eventually. It's just going to take an, an absurdly large x value to hit that point. Okay. Uh, sorry, the x value of 100 will give you an absurdly large f of x value, an absurdly large y value, but it does get there. Uh, for the natural log, ln of x, uh, we see that x is continuous everywhere above 0. So uh, you cannot give ln x a value of 0 or anything negative. So it is only continuous from the 0 point over to the right. And these are the functions you should be relatively familiar with. Now, okay, why is this important? Well, it's important because we can ask ourselves, why is this function e to the sine x over 2 plus cos pi of x continuous? Where is it continuous? How do we know it's continuous? Well, here's where we take our information, right? So let's start with sine of x. We know that sine of x is going to be continuous anywhere. So it doesn't matter what our x value is. It can be between negative infinity and infinity. It is continuous. Okay, if we raise e, or if we raise sine x using the exponential function, so we have e to the sine x, well, x can still be whatever, because e is continuous everywhere, the function, so e to the x is continuous no matter what x value we put in. Sine of x is continuous no matter what value we put in, so this is okay. Okay, now let's take a look at the denominator. So we have 2 plus cosine pi of x. So where is cosine pi of x continuous? 
Well, again, it's a big function. Sine and cosine are both going to be continuous everywhere, so that's good. Uh, what about 2? Well, 2 is also continuous literally everywhere because it's a constant. So if we add 2 plus cosine of pi x together, uh, once again, this will be continuous no matter what value of x we pick. So this is really nice, actually. It doesn't matter what x we pick. Uh, all of these functions independently are continuous. Okay, so now we're going to take e to the sine x. We're going to divide it by 2 plus cosine of pi x. We know from our laws that if we have f and if we have g, and they're both continuous on an interval, then we're going to have f over g continuous, provided that whatever our value is for g, it cannot be zero. So we, we have this. We know based on the numerator and the denominator that both can be continuous no matter which x we pick, but we have to make sure, we have to make sure that this value does not equal zero, okay? And we're safe. You know why we're safe? Because cosine of pi of x, that value is going to go somewhere between one and negative one. So the highest the denominator is going to be is three, and the lowest the denominator is going to be is one. So this value will always be somewhere between one and three. So we don't need to worry about this. We're never gonna have our function on the bottom equal to zero. So we can say then that this entire function e to the sine x over two plus cosine pi of x is going to be continuous everywhere. Okay, so this problem is nice because everything is continuous at all points, but you might get functions where you have a, a function that's only continuous from negative one to one being involved in all of this. You have to find the smallest interval where everything is continuous. So uh, keep that in mind as you go forward. If you want more difficult problems on this, I can always make another video with exercises. Um, but if you have any questions, leave them down below and I'll do my best to answer them or someone else can take a look at them.